I'm John Fraser, a conservation psychologist with New Knowledge Organization and a member of the Society for Environmental, Population and Conservation Psychology, which is a division of the American Psychological Association. People often ask about the difference between environmental psychology, population psychology and conservation psychology. They each have unique ways of focusing on mental process, on how we come to understand the world around us. In particular, environmental psychology has a long history of understanding people's relationships to nature, how they experience nature, what benefits they derive from nature, whether that's seeing a tree or coming to understand an environmental system. Really, it's about part of ourselves and how nature informs our lives. We know that when children can see trees from their classroom, they will do better on tests than children who can't. This kind of natural affordance uh, gives children a way of thinking. We recognize through environmental psychologist research that nature benefits people. Now population psychology is a different strand of thinking, more about the overpopulation challenge and how people think about having children, having a lot of children, or having a few children, and what kind of quality of life is for families. It's grown to include how populations engage with the world around them and how populations influence thinking. Conservation psychology is really the third arm of this thinking, and it emerges in parallel to movements in the sciences. In the earth sciences, in the 1980s, there was a recognition that conservation was a cross-cutting idea. And around the end of the 1980s, a group came together to recognize that there was a need for something called conservation biology. The need to recognize that no matter what field you were working in, whether it was island biogeography, how chemical processes work, large-scale geography, these were all necessary for conservation biology. So at the turn of the century, a psychologist who had really been raised looking at animal behavior came to recognize that if we want to promote behavior change, if we want to promote conservation, that it was possible to think about psychology in a new way, to map the different disciplines in psychology against a conservation objective. Unlike environmental psychology, conservation psychology recognizes that people are addicted to the overconsumption of natural resources on which we depend. And we recognize that through psychological process, through mental process, it's possible to help people wean themselves from this addiction unlike environmental psychology that looks at how environment influences the person, how it affects the, the individual in their future. Conservation psychology focuses on how we encourage changes in behavior which will lead to significant environmental protection. So in conservation psychology, we are interested in the mechanisms, how groups work together, how groups can choose to engage in environmental solutions, and we work with individuals to understand how they are thinking about themselves in relation to a chosen action. Our goal is to focus on environmental conservation, and that is what makes this, to me, more of an activist discipline. Some of our work has been organized around how are people thinking in zoos. A project that we did looked at the environmental values of people who go to zoos, people who don't like zoos, who actually argue against the existence of zoos, and the people who don't go to zoos at all. What we discovered is that the people who go to zoos are more like animal rights activists who disagree with zoos than the people that don't go at all. Both are concerned with animals and animal welfare. They extend their scope of justice to include animals as part of themselves. While much of psychology focuses on how people think of themselves within groups, in environmental psychology and in conservation psychology, we look at how people think of themselves and nature, natural systems, as either part of themselves or not part of themselves. It's through understanding these theories, these ideas of how people incorporate nature in their sense of themselves, that we can see predicting future choices. Other psychologists will talk about environmental identity, how we see ourselves within the environment. For us as an organization, we're particularly interested in how these ideas replicate within groups, within cultures, and how different cultures interact around their ideas of justice.
At our organization, we're really interested in how organizations are working together to talk about themselves and their relationship to nature. Not at the individual environmental identity level, but as groups and collectives thinking about larger systems. We're interested in how video and film structure the story of nature and build metaphors that people attach to. It's often easy to talk about animals that look like us, whether they're primates, whether they're chimpanzees, even bunnies, cats, and dogs. It's not as easy to talk about the conservation of animals that we see as aversive or threatening. This is the kind of information that we're interested in, because if we want to conserve biological systems, we have to accept nature in all of its diversity. We have to understand the way animals that scare us are also part of the system. One study I did many years ago looked at what people think about sharks. People are actually quite offended by shark finning. In general, all people don't like the idea. They find the idea of cutting off the fin of a shark and releasing that animal to be wasteful. Yet some care about the experience that animal might have, that shark who has lost his fin. Others, though, don't have the same level of concern. Sometimes it can be the words we use around animals, it can be what the animal looks like, and so we have diminished concern. It's difficult to talk about how clever a pig is, and at the same time talk about that as food, if you extend your concern towards those animals. But not all people do. So as conservation psychologists, we see ourselves adding to a larger story, the story of how environment informs the mind, how population choices are made, and our population lives on our planet, and what we need in order, as people, to choose to act in ways which will protect the biosphere on which all human life depends. And we see that as a large story that is about sharing information across the field of psychology and how psychology informs our mental process. Thank you.